Uh, today, uh, we wrap up our series on the alternative kingdom. We have spent a number of weeks diving into Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus' teaching about how to live in his kingdom, which is so very unlike our world. And I don't know about you, but for me, this has really challenged me at a very personal level. It has is, it is really, uh, really challenged me how, I, how I'm supposed to live. It's challenged me in my own life um, and realizing how much I fall short of Jesus' kingdom calling. But it's also challenged me as a preacher and teacher. My default as a person is to make everybody happy. And it, it's challenged me because, I, I, you know, sometimes I just, I, 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 my hang up is I don't necessarily like to say things that could potentially offend somebody or upset somebody. And then you have Jesus' teachings. <laughs> and they're just straight up countercultural. They are offensive, and they can be in your face, and then I'm given the task to teach them. <laughs> it's like, really, God? Like, you really want me to teach on things like anger and lust and divorce? Like, seriously? You want me to teach that? And each week, I've been faced with a choice to either say what Jesus says or to go with my default and say what Scripture says in a way that, that makes everybody like it, that, that's warm, that's inviting, that you agree with. And if I'm being honest, each week was a hard heart check for me, where I had to evaluate how I was going to approach Jesus' teaching. And I hope and I pray that I did not get in God's way of his word. And each week as I prepared to come up here to give another sermon, Without fail, I would think this is going to be the hardest sermon I've ever had to preach. Until Monday, and I was studying for the next week, and then I would think this is going to be the hardest sermon I've ever had to preach. And as I was preparing this message, kind of looking back over the Sermon on the Mount, I, I kept having this thought come to me in the back of my mind. And it's, where do we go from here? Like looking at everything that we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is teaching, where do we go from here? I mean, after everything is said and done, what does God want us to do with his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount? Several weeks back, we talked about the need to make a decision about Jesus, that Jesus calls us to make a decision about him. He wants us to enter into a relationship with him where he is our king and our savior, that he is the one who calls the shots in our life. He is our boss, uh, so to speak, but he's also our savior. He forgives all of our mistakes, even our, our failing to live up to his standard. And the way we come to know that we have a relationship with him comes down to the posture of our heart. Where is our heart at? If we have a relationship with Jesus, it shows up in our obedience to his word. But what happens next? Where do we go from here? Well, in a few short days, we're going to be entering into the new year, 2020. That's so crazy to me. And I know many of you might be slightly jaded and pessimistic toward things like New Year's resolutions and the whole goal-setting thing. I know many, many of you are probably pessimistic about that. But there's still, nonetheless, a lot of people who make goals uh, to set out to accomplish for the new year. Some of these are good. Some of these are unrealistic. And so imagine with me, if you will, that you just sat through Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Like you showed up to church, Jesus was the speaker, and he gave the Sermon on the Mount, and you were there. And so afterwards, you wanted to take Jesus out for coffee or lunch, and you had in the back of your mind echoing around this so what question. And so you just, you really want Jesus to boil everything down, to give you a few pointers for the new year on how you can apply his teaching. And so in light of this, in light of the new year, you ask Jesus a question like this. You say, Jesus, the new year is just right around the corner. And I loved your sermon, by the way, Jesus. And I, I really want to live this different kind of life, this alternate life that you talk about uh, based on, on your sermon. But what goals 
would you give me for the new year? What do you think Jesus would say to you? How would he answer that question? Do you think Jesus would give us, give you some goals? <laughs> would Jesus be straightforward? Would, would Jesus tell you a story? Would Jesus ask you a question? Would Jesus say something like, oh, have you not been paying attention? Like, I have been telling you this whole time what to do. And what would Jesus say? I mean, it's a completely hypothetical, but what goals does Jesus want us to deduce from the Sermon on the Mount? In what ways does Jesus want us to walk away from his message doing or not doing? That's the question that hopefully we can answer today. Um, excuse me, I... If you have your Bibles, I lost my place. I'm human. If you have your Bibles, um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. And so if you want to turn there, uh, you can follow along uh, in your Bibles. We'll also have it on the screen. Here's Jesus' words. We'll come back to this whole judgment thing, or this whole um, New Year's resolution thing. But Jesus says this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door, and it will be op open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the, to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which of you, if his son asks for, asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to you, those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law. For this is the law and the prophets. It's an odd passage to talk about a New Year's resolution, right? And I'm sure some of you are thinking, uh, where are you going with this? So hang in, we'll come back to this New Year's resolution thing. With this passage, or at least the first and the last part of this verse, are among the most familiar to those who have no affiliation with Jesus. I can recall on one occasion, I asked a little girl what her favorite Bible verse was, and she said, without missing a beat, do not judge or you will be judged. And I... And I I thought, oh, you know, how inspiring. Like, what do you say to that? Oh, I can see how, um, why that's your favorite verse. <laughs> like, like, what do you say? Like, you can't even ask a follow-up question on that for fear that you may um, come across too judgy. And everybody knows Jesus doesn't want us to be judgy. And, and then you have, at the last part of this, the golden rule. Do to others whatever you, whatever you would like them to do to you. And I can remember when I wasn't a Christian, quoting this to somebody who was just being a complete um, jerk to me, and, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing anything wrong, they just kind of assumed that I was the wrongdoer, being completely unfair, and I quoted this passage to him, do to others as you would have them do to you, and I had no idea this was even in the Bible. It just felt intrinsically true. So what does Jesus mean? What does he mean? What does he mean by do not judge? Many people believe that Jesus is saying that we are never to judge others, no matter what, no matter the circumstance, no matter the purpose. Is that what Jesus is saying? We live in a sound bite world. That is, we hear nicely constructed, punchy statements of truth. We carry them around, and, and no doubt, Jesus in the Bible, there's many one-liners, one-line statements we, we, we repeat all the time. They're very famous. 
gifts. There's tons of them, right? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. God helps those who help themselves. Just kidding, that last one's not in the Bible. But many people hold these statements in the Bible as these quotable maxims of truth, great wisdom for all ages, and they sound really good. The problem is that when those get ripped out of the Bible, when they get ripped out of the, uh, the context of Scripture, they stop being the timeless truth we believe about them. And the same is true here. You can read the first verse, do not judge or you will be judged. And if you ignore the context, you will think that Jesus is condemning the act of making evaluative judgments about people and about life choices. But not only is that not what Jesus is saying, that is just flat out bad advice. Let me explain. As a parent, as a parent, you have to make judgments all the time. As a parent, you have to be pretty judgmental of your kids. You have to make all kinds of evaluations. When, when your uh, son or daughter, uh, if, if, you have sibling, if they have siblings, and they hit the other one, like you have to, you have to respond to that. You have to, you have to make rules in your household for what they should do, what they should not do, for behaviors, for consequences. And however you look at what you do in that moment as a parent, you are making judgment calls. You are making evaluations. And it would be the worst parenting advice to say to your child who hit their sibling, because Jesus told me not to judge, I'm not going to intervene. I'm not going to hold them accountable. I'm not going to punish them. I'm not going to correct them because... You know, I don't want to come off too judgy. You know, everybody knows. Jesus said, do not judge. And so you send them on their way. Like, that's bad parenting advice. Like, don't do that. <laughs> right? And we can see how ridiculous that is, right? I mean, at least I hope we can. What about a teacher who, who, has, to, who has to grade a, a student's paper, who has to evaluate it, or a coach who has to evaluate a player's performance, or a boss who has to address underperformance and among his employees, judgment, discernment, assessment are a, a necessary part of life. And even if you disagree with me about that point, you still had to make a judgment about what I said. So what is Jesus after here? What is Jesus, I guess, against here? Is Jesus uh, against con uh, con uh, condemning the use of evaluation? I think for most rational people, the answer is easy, right? Of course not. Of course Jesus is not against that. So what is he teaching us not to do? Is he te telling us that we should not evaluate the life choices of other people? Well, that's clearly not what Jesus is saying. I mean, how could it be? Because just a few verses down the road, Jesus actually tells us that we're supposed to evaluate people by the fruit of their life, that we are to be able to recognize true disciples from false ones by their fruit, by their life choices. Is he condemning people confronting or correcting others? Right? I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, who are you to judge me? This is my life. You live your life, I'll live my life. You have no right to judge me. So is Jesus against confronting? Is Jesus against correcting? Well, if you read Jesus' verse, uh, Jesus' words in context, <laughs> that couldn't be any further from the truth. In fact, contrary to popular opinion, Jesus actually does call us to judge. He does. He calls us to correct. He tells us that we are to remove our own issues so that we can see more clearly to help somebody else. So what is Jesus calling us to refrain from doing? Well, if you're taking notes, here's what Jesus is calling us to refrain from doing. It is not against evaluation. It is not against correcting. It is against condemning. That is what Jesus is re calling us to refrain from. He's not against evaluating or correcting others. 
He actually tells us that we are to, um, we are to evaluate, we are to judge, but to do it with right judgment, with right perspective. What Jesus is against is when people think that they have the role and the authority to condemn others for their sins, their failures, their shortcomings. Jesus is against people who, who, are think, who think and speak as if they are the righteous judge who can condemn others. Uh, there is only one who sees correctly, only one who sees rightly to make final statements about somebody's life. And that is not us, right? James, James puts it like this in James 4. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? James says there is only one lawgiver and judge. And when we act as the lawgiver and judge, and condemn other people, we actually fall under the same condemnation that we are condemning them. Being a breaker of God's law. And Jesus gives us, he gives us three reasons why we should not judge or condemn others. First, he says, you will be judged. You will be judged. In verse 1, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And this is not readily apparent in the English as it is in the Greek. But this, in this verse, is what scholars call a divine passive, which is a way to name God as the agent. God is the one who is doing the acting, uh, the, the, the judging part here. It's a way of naming God without actually putting God's name down. Uh, they had a lot of respect for God's name. And so what Jesus is, um, is saying here is that he is saying that if you condemn others, then realize, realize that God will condemn you along with them. And so if you don't want that to happen, then don't sit in God's judgment seat condemning others. Second reason not to judge is that the standard that we use to judge will be used to us. In other words, if, if we condemn others based on how law-abiding they are, based on how moral they are, based on how uh, good of citizens they are, based on how uh, biblical they are, based on how obedient to God's law, as, uh, God's law, based on how knowledgeable they are, or even based on how Christian church they are, Jesus says, then realize that God will evaluate you by those same standards. <laughs> and for me reading this, I am reminded about how inconsistent I am in my own life. And it, this is like glaringly obvious to me. I remember one morning, I woke up and I, I went to our cabinet. I love coffee. I went to our cabinet to grab a coffee cup uh, to get some, some coffee. And as I opened it, I noticed that about two-thirds of our coffee cups were missing. And the other third was in the sink, um, dirty, because I failed to clean them the night before, and so I was a tad frustrated, and so I blamed Stephanie, my wife, <laughs> for leaving them in her car, <laughs> and then I got into my car, um, started the car, and I was heading to the office, and I looked around, and I saw a lot of coffee cups. I counted nine coffee cups. <laughs> Friends and family, that's a lot of coffee cups in my car. So I had to gather all of those coffee cups, do the walk of shame, and juggle them into our house and apologize for blaming Stephanie. And if I'm inconsistent in a small area like coffee cups, how much greater is my inconsistency to living out God's command? And, and how much more obvious is my inconsistencies to God who sees all and knows all? Jesus' point is that we fail miserably to to live up to our own standards, let alone God's standards. And if we don't want God to, to judge us based on those standards, then we have got to not hang those over other people. The third reason not to judge 
is because we need to attend to ourselves first. We need to attend to ourselves first. And this is precisely Jesus' main point in this passage. Verse 3, Jesus says this. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Uh, this, is, this is funny imagery. This is, um, this, this is, this is um, saturated with humor. Uh, the log that Jesus is referring to, it would have been the main beam of wood that would have ran across the floor of a house or even the roof of a house, providing some solid structure. This thing was massive. Huge, 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 huge piece of wood. And you see what Jesus is doing here with this verse, right? He continues, verse 4. He says, or how can you say to your brother, uh, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when, you, when there is a log in your own eye? Uh, part of Jesus' point here is that the sins of others often appear bigger than our own. But Jesus wants us to have a different perspective towards sin. He wants, us, he wants us to see our sin as a bigger deal than somebody else's, as a bigger issue than somebody else's, a bigger problem than somebody else's. Verse 5. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so what's Jesus' point? Well, the main emphasis for Jesus is that we would attend to ourselves first. And when we attend to ourselves acknowledging the plank, the log in our own eye, then we can see clearly to help somebody else out, to help somebody who has a speck in their own eye. But, but notice, notice, notice what the goal of seeing the speck in someone else's eye is. It is not to condemn them. It is to help them. It has a, a spirit of restoration in it. That's what the goal is of seeing uh, that in somebody else. And if you look at what Jesus goes on to say in this passage, he goes in a different direction than what most of us would expect. After Jesus talks about not condemning others, and then he talks about the need for us to look inside of ourselves, and then he says, don't throw your pearls to pigs. That is, don't be wasteful with your words to those who will not receive what you're going to say. And then he gives a lesson on prayer that in essence says, hey, God knows how to give good gifts. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And for me, as I was reading this passage and studying it, I thought, how is any of that connected? How, how do those go together? I mean, in my mind, Jesus should jump from judgment do not judge, and then teach all that, and then go straight to the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Like, to me, that, that seems like that's how the flow should be. And the whole bit about pigs, dogs, and prayers, it just seems like a detour. Why does he include that? Why does he talk about that? What is his point? Let's, let's talk briefly about those three sections, and then we'll kind of circle around uh, for an answer. The next thing that Jesus talks about is pigs, pearls, and dogs. Jesus picks up this language right out of the book of Proverbs. And the point is not, it's not to name somebody as a dog. It's not to name somebody as a, as a pig, but simply to point out that sometimes people are not as receptive to receiving what we're going to say to them. People are not as receptive to getting help with getting the speck out of their own eye, sometimes people will blow it off, and other times people will blow up on you. Therefore, Jesus says, don't waste your time for those who will not receive what you're going to say. The point on prayer is to say God is greater in his love, God is greater in his goodness toward us than even our earthly parents. And then the whole golden rule thing is a real practical guide for life. The good that you want to receive from others, act like that toward others. That if you want people to treat you respectfully, kindly, fairly, gently, then act that way toward other people. So what does any of that have to do, though, with judge not? What does any of that have to do with Jesus' teaching on judgment? 
because they are all connected. They're all related, but how are they connected? Well, if you have been tracking with us in this series on the Sermon on the Mount, or are you familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that you may have noticed is that Jesus has laid out a series of moral demands for his disciples. These are some moral commands that Jesus gives us as his disciples. Jesus has told us that we are to live in his kingdom as his disciples the way that he expects of us, that we should think and respond in ways that are distinctively Jesus-like, not like the world. We are to be shaped by this kingdom. And so he talks about what we should consider to be the blessed life, the beatitude, what we should do with our anger, our lust, with divorce, with promises, with revenge, and with enemies. And he even addresses real practical spiritual things like prayer, giving, fasting. And his point is that as his disciple, this is what he calls us to live up to. I mean, it's, it's simple and, and straightforward. But it's so very easy to look at Jesus' words, the words that are authoritative, the words that are meant to guide us as disciples. It's so easy to look at, at, at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and then begin to kind of construct this sort of standard, this this paradigm, uh, this lens by which to judge the rest of the world for not living up to Jesus' own teaching. And do you see how judgment would play, play a part into Jesus' teachings at this point? That he's laid out all of these moral teachings for his disciples. And it's so very easy to slip into this, this, this mindset that we are to take Jesus' teaching and build this, this, um, this paradigm where we judge and evaluate and condemn the rest of the world for not living out Jesus' teaching. As the disciples, it's so easy to look at Jesus' teaching, say, on, on issues of sexuality, on issues of divorce, on issues of murder, and then begin to condemn non-followers of Jesus for not living out Jesus' commands. And Jesus' point with the Sermon on the Mount is not to equip the church with ammunition to fire at the rest of the world for not, for not following the commands of a Savior they don't believe in. I mean, it's as if Jesus is saying to, 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 his, to his guys, to, the God, to all the people there, guys, gather around, gather around. I want you to hear me out because this is going to be really hard for you not to do for like the rest of your life. But I did not give you these teachings so that you would point condemning fingers at the rest of the world for being so unlike me and so unlike you. I'm teaching this to you not so that you would look outward, but that you would look inward. I'm giving you this teaching so that you would be able to see the log that's in your own eye. Jesus' teachings, they're not meant to condemn those outside of Jesus' kingdom. They are meant to convict those inside of the kingdom. And when we use Jesus' kingdom rules, Jesus' kingdom standards, and condemn those who are not yet a part of Jesus' kingdom, we betray Jesus' words and we run the risk of inviting God to go ahead and condemn us along with the rest of the world. But what's the connection with prayer? What's the connection with the golden rule, right? Here it is, if you're taking notes. It is to show us the way of mercy. It's to show us the way of mercy. When we look inside of ourselves, <laughs> instead of out there, we are then faced with the reality that we ourselves, we do not measure up to God's perfect standards. And this leads us to our need. It leads us to our need. It leads us to asking God to be merciful to us. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Introspection, true introspection, true um, looking inside of ourselves, it leads us to prayer. And Jesus says, God is good. God is good. He's a better father to, to us than to those on 
earth. He is a better father to us than when we come to him, when we come to our gracious father asking for mercy. He is good and he gives it. Mercy. Mercy is not getting treated as our sins deserve. Mercy is is God not treating us according to what we have done wrong. And when we receive God's good gift of mercy, it then leads us to being merciful toward others, including our own evaluations and judgments, i.e. the golden rule. So two closing questions. First, Jesus calls us to judge. How in the world do we do that without condemning? or condoning. Second, um, what, what, what goals would Jesus have for us in 2020? Like if we actually sat down with him, what would he tell us are some goals to aim for? How do we judge in a way that is helpful rather than condoning or condemning? What's hard but simple Act to others in a way that you want God to act toward you. How did God act toward us? Well, instead of condemning us to an eternity in judgment, judgment was placed on Jesus on the cross. Judgment was was placed on Jesus. And as a result, we were shown, as a result, we were given mercy. Therefore, since God has modeled mercy to us, we are to model mercy toward others including and especially those who are outside of Jesus' kingdom. And we tend to speak harshly and cruelly to others when we have failed to look inside of ourselves. We tend to be the harshest toward uh, those outside of the church, outside of the faith, when we have failed to see our own spiritual poverty and our absolute need for God's mercy on a daily basis. And Jesus, the point as you act toward others in the way that you want God to treat you at the end of your life. Our, our lives will either be shaped by Jesus' cross, where judgment was placed on him and mercy given to us, or our lives will be shaped by putting other people on the cross and throwing um, our judgment, throwing our um, con- condemnation on them. God is fair, God is a just God. We don't get into God's kingdom because we, you know, reach a, a certain moral standard. We don't get into God's kingdom because we have um, reached a, a religious standard, but because we recognize that we have failed. We have failed to live up to his perfect standard. We have failed to live up to even our own standard, and that humbles us to ask for his forgiveness, to ask for God's mercy. But what, what would Jesus have us do for 2020? What goals would Jesus have for us? I imagine if we were sitting across the table from Jesus, coffee, lunch, whatever, and Jesus had his, has, had his sermon notes scattered on the table, uh, that I imagine that, that he would slide them across the table and he would say to us something to this effect, I want you to take these words home. Read them. But don't do so so that you can see how other people in your life can shape up. But listen to my words. Because when I spoke them, I was not primarily thinking about how you can get that other person to change their ways. No, I was primarily thinking about you when I preached it. Read my words and look deep in your own soul. I have a lot of work to do on you. I'm not done. and I'm I'm probably never going to be done with you. But look inside of yourself, and when you do, you will realize how nasty and ugly the sin in your life truly is. And hopefully, that will lead you to setting up another conversation with me, maybe coffee, maybe lunch, whatever. Maybe it will lead you back to a conversation with me, and I want you to know that I would be more than happy to welcome another conversation with you. And I can promise that when you come back to me, I will always come with mercy. But I understand this one thing. What I want to do in you and through you is far bigger than anything you can possibly imagine. 
Focus on living out my teaching more than condemning those who don't. And as you do, I want you to watch how I will make you into a light and the world a city on a hill. Live with humility and grace. Depend on mercy as an infant depends on his mother's milk. Before we leave, let me give you a story to take with you as I expect you to live. Luke 18. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood, uh, uh, stood, um, he stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. And I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. Well, the tax collector stood at a distance and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And this is Jesus' word for us.